Uh, good morning. So I hope you still have some brain power left. That was an intense morning session, very informative. So let me go with the first one. And uh, I thought I will tackle first off the gaps and challenges that we're facing. And uh, this is something that you may not know. I have no sound. <coughs> some sound okay so this is a gap that I think all of you will recognize state of NIH funding it's pretty dry I will say I will say that's that's a big gap in challenges in my research this one is another gap that I found don't know if you know what it represent a bunch of bloodthirsty animals also known as study section. That will be your proposal right there. <laughs> very, very daring. And if you do, we saw the first day there were a lot of animation on, on microbial composition 3D with Rob and, and Jacques. So I thought I would put a 3D animation of these gaps. It will go like that. So it will be uh, you sending out Such your uh, microbiome proposal. It's one of the will answer big questions, major question in the field, and you think that it's going to be funded. You already have your team, recruiting people, you smell the money, and uh, all is good in your life. <laughs> then you got, you got on e-commerce and you saw the score. It's not very good. Actually, you have to think about uh, your career because uh, you put so much faith in this proposal that now you're down on your knees and uh, thinking about plan B. <laughs> but you're a scientist for God's sake. So you come back, call the PO and to enhance the team, change the aims and come back and submit again and get the money because we need to move the field forward, right? So, keep the faith. <laughs> um, indeed. So I hope I'm not in trouble with the NIH staff here. <laughs> I, I'll, I'm a reviewer, right? So, um, so what I want to do here is to tackle a little bit generally the cancer and the microbiome interaction, but specifically going after colorectal cancer. This is a cartoon that. Uh, will be part of a, a review, invited review for Nature Cancer. Uh, but the idea is that different organs are linked to different forms of, of, of cancer, uh, microbiome driven. Sometimes it's, it's like the liver microbial products. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a, an isolate in a different organ affecting a distal site like pancreas and, and oral uh, pathogen. And other time will be like in the colon where you have a microbiome next to the organ that will be affected. And I will focus on that if you don't mind. Colorectal cancer, there's many factorial, it's a multifactorial diseases. Disease is host genetics, diet, and inflammation. And, and we learned for the past two days that inflammation is the powerful environmental factor shaping microbial constitution, composition, activities. So it's tantalizing to link this to cancer. Obviously, there is a link between inflammation and cancer, but could you bring in the microbiome and then make a sequential uh, uh, effect on inflammation, cancer, uh, microbiome, and cancer? And we know I will skip fast on that. I mean, IBD cohorts have been uh, screened for microbiome composition. We know there's cluster between healthy Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, two different forms of IBD. Diversity is affected. This is an old Stone, uh, stone Age paper that was using, I think, TRFLP. New data, so many, many groups, different cohorts have all uh, confirmed that there is a dysbiosis, a change in the microbial composition. We know a little bit in the resolution which microbes could be associated with disease, especially the proteobacteria, gamma proteobacteria, and enterobacteria ECs. For, for Crohn's disease, and a reduction of Clostridia, uh, butyrate producer, and also Treg regulator. So we have a dysbiosis that may be functionally linked to IBD. 
we still have to work the detail of that, but it's there. And, and if you put this in motion in terms of colorectal cancer, the colitis aspect of colorectal cancer was mostly thought as a host uh, dysregulation. We have inflammatory mediators coming in from the epithelium, immune cells, and it will hit somehow this cocktail of, of inflammatory mediator will hit the epithelium, cause this plastic response, DNA damage, and progress to adenocarcinoma, and many transcription factors in cytokine. Cytokines have been associated to that and causally found to be responsive, uh, responsible for the disease. So we have this figured out. But one thing that we know, this organ has, uh, is hosting an abundant microbiome. So what is the microbiome doing? And for many years we thought that, at least in the field of colitis, it was just a fuel to set more uh, inflammatory response. So a trigger perpetuator of inflammation. And that's how you get to the cancer. Uh, but the question is, is that all the microbiome could do? And I will focus on bacterial microbiome here. And people have done, in the past two years, a lot of survey using different compartments. I'm not going to name all the bacteria, but there is an abundance, an increased expansion of some group, a decrease of other in the luminal compartment. And if you look at tissue uh, compartment, mucosal samples, in, in early uh, stage of cancer and late, there's also a dysbiosis. It's very hard to, to pinpoint a, an association and in a cause to that. So it's mostly, and all the papers don't have time to uh, 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 highlight everyone, but there is an active group from different uh, part of the world looking at that, different cohorts. So it's clear we have dysbiosis. What is the cause? effect relationship that is difficult to do in patients, so you need to introduce animal model. And the question we were asking is what happened to the microbiome during the onset of colitis? The progression, is the microbiome in tune with the inflammatory uh, response of the host, and what does it do in terms of cancer development? Well, we use a simple model, we, you, you heard about it, uh, so germ-free mice. Uh, the reason why you have germ-free mice is because you, you, you avoid the legacy and the familial transmission uh, of microbes that sometimes drive cage effect, although we have a paper uh, just showing that founder's effect is not the main cause of cage effect, but that's another ballgame. Uh, so you have wild-type mice, which is your control mice, or susceptible mice we use for colitis cancer, or IL-10 knockout, which is an immunosuppressive molecule, not, no IL-10 knockout, this, this control or dysregulation of the immune response, and the phenotype is colitis. But they don't have colitis in the germ-free environment. If you move them into an SPF where they have environmental microbes coming in, then you have colitis. We use a compound that's called isoxymethane to initiate cancer, and then you survey at different time the microbiome in the stools, so two weeks will be a mild colitis, 12 weeks, a, a, a strong colitis with high-grade dysplasia, and 20 weeks, uh, full colitis and invasive tumors. So you could sequence. And what we did here is to compare the microbiome of these mice, wild type, out and knockout. So this is two weeks cohort, individual symbols is an individual mouse, all the incorporated microbiome. And in the wild type mice, who will not develop colitis, after 12 and 20 weeks, the biome just assemble, and this is ecological assembly of the biome. There's no differences, actually, between the 12 and the 20 weeks. So they end up in a region of their microbiome is stable, and that's how they, they assemble. In the out and knockout, where you have here the uh, colitis, and later on the colitis cancer, you could see that there is a clustering that is highly significant. So when cancer, when the, the, the colitis progress, it does, it does shape the microbiome and the cancer, as well as another factor. If you do pie cross analysis on this community now that is in the, col in the colitis cancer, uh, you can't read that, but the red symbols means that there are genes that are highly abundant. And most of them are in the type secretion system, type one, two, three, five. And a, and a secretion system is often associated with a more aggressive behavior from the microbiome. So you have a microbiome that is a little bit more uh, prone to, uh, to uh, looking for trouble, if I might say. 
If you look at uh, flagellin, which is another very important factor that, utilize, that microbes utilize to colonize, penetrate, and get close to the epithelium, you need to be mobile. And all these genes are highly uh, abundant, higher in the colitis cancer. But if you go with the phylum level now, because you have generated a lot of data with the sequencing, where do you go from there? If you look here, this is a color code, so red means highly significant and, and more abundant in the alt and knockout than the wild type. You have two groups, two phylums that are highly, uh, uh, that change. So the proteobacteria and the viricro microbia. So where do you go? We took a bias approach with the proteobacteria because we knew from the human sequencing that this group is also associated with higher abundance in patient. If you go down to the family level and then compare over time, so two, uh, two, uh, two weeks, 12 and 20 weeks, this is the IL-10 and the wild type, you see always an increase, higher abundance enterobacteriaceae over time, although the niche diminish when you move to full colitis inflammation. That's an interesting observation. Uh, but yet, you always have more of these uh, microbial family in the animal that have colitis and cancer. This is Illumina sequencing. You, don't doubt, you go down, it can go down to species. This is uh, with the RDP, it was a consensus 27, fitting the Irshia, the Irshia and Shigella. But we knew from the literature that at this point that people have a, uh, identified E. coli, adherent invasive E. coli on IBD patient, on their mucosal, highly, uh, highly representative, and also in colorectal cancer. So the E. coli was of, of great importance. This is the E. coli I'm talking about. It's not a HEHEC, HEPEC, uh, classical pathogenic microorganism. It's the one that you have in your bowel that somehow may acquire a more aggressive phenotype because of a change of, in the environment. And we did a, a, a selected bias PCR analysis of 16S looking at E. coli in these cohorts, and we found higher abundance of E. coli in the IL-10. So we had the idea that the change with inflammation, the change of microbial composition, there is a group of bacteria that expand. There's many, many more bacteria, but we were interested in the E. coli because of the link with uh, colorectal cancer in, in patient. So what do you do after that? Well, we took an E. coli that we had uh, called NC101, which is North Carolina 101, was, associate, uh, was found and, and, and isolated at North Carolina State University. This is non-pathogenic E. coli again. And do go back to the germ-free IL-10, and then you mono-associate, so you control the system. So what you do here, you, put, you introduce the E. coli NC101, and an Enterococcus fecalis, or oral human isolate, that we knew also induced colitis in this system. And now if you change these microbial uh, status uh, in the mouse, what will happen to inflammation? Cancer, this is histological score of, of inflammation between the two monoassociated mice, E. fecalis, E. coli, very similar. This is tumor, tumor multiplicity and invasion, and you could see that you have quite of a difference in the capacity to induce cancer. So the inflammation is quite similar, but the cancer capacity is different. So there is, again, a link between the microbial constituent, who do you have in there, and how could they influence your cancer development. And we always thought that inflammation was the driving force. And from there, it seems that the microbes have something very important to say in, in influencing diseases. So what is that micro, what is that E. coli uh, has that make it more susceptible or more aggressive in, in, in inducing cancer? And that's, that goes back to looking and, 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 and sequencing and having information in, your, in, in the genome of these bugs. We found that this bug has a PKS island, which is a genotoxic island, 22 genes. 54 KB, it's a massive amount of, of, of multi-azymatic system. And literature have found that in this pathogenic E. coli, it's an extraintestinal E. coli, SP15, that when they introduced that in the mouse as an ileal loop, they found DNA damage. So we thought since we, our E. coli has this PKS, it may be responsible. So what you do, you do genetic deletion of the PKS island in the E. coli, and you compare with the competent isogenic E. coli, 
and go back to the animal model and ask the question, do I have cancer in this system? Does it impact inflammation? What we found is that in terms of inflammatory capacity, at different time point, which is 12, 14, and 15, 18 weeks, the inflammatory capacity of the wild type of mutant E. coli was very similar. So remove this island, the bug is still inducing massive inflammation. Now, what happened to cancer? You remove the PKS and you, have, you lose the ability or the strength of, of cancer promotion. That's the invasion multiplicity. So the E. coli was quite, uh, the PKS of E. coli was very important in driving the cancer susceptibility but not changing the inflammatory host response. So this is an E. coli that was a murine isolate. Well, is that gene has any relevance to human diseases? So we went to a cohort. I told you that E. coli was associated, uh, isolated from many, many different populations in UK and in, in, in US. So we linked with a group in UK. They had access to a bank of E. coli, and we screened for the PKS island. And what we found is that this is clinical isolate now, human. We found that the prevalence of E. coli uh, having this, this PKS was much more higher, roughly three times higher in the population that have uh, colorectal cancer and then the control population. And that was confirmed by another group in France using a different cohort, looking at different uh, uh, cytotoxic virulence factor, but the PKS was also found to be 20% in the control, roughly, and 55% in the uh, colorectal cancer, very similar to us. So. Again, it's an association, the disease, it doesn't mean that the PKS was causative of cancer, but it's, it shows that the E. coli has the capacity, that the E. coli that caused cancer in our system has the same, the gene is present in the, uh, in the human population. So just to go back, I said that the inflammation is a powerful force shaping the microbial com composition, but is it all it could do? So what we're very interested to know is the inflammation. If you have a group of bacteria that expand during inflammation, if you take them and introduce them back in a mouse that is susceptible to cancer, will it cause cancer by itself? And, 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 and what is the role of inflammation? So what we did here, again, is germ-free mice, the AL-10, and also we use an AL-10 RAG2. These mice lack T, mature T and B cells, so they can't uh, go into chronic inflammation. So you remove inflammation from that mouse, basically, and come back with the NC101. And what we found is that inflammation, the bugs induce inflammation in the AL-10, but in the, in the AL-10 RAC2, there's no inflammation. So now you remove the capacity to, to, uh, to induce inflammation, but you still have the E. coli with the PKS island. Will that induce cancer? And it doesn't or it has a strong reduction. So now, you, I don't want to confuse you, but it puts a lot of, of intricate relationship between inflammation, composition, and activity of bacteria. Here we have no host inflammation, and the bugs that have a functional PKS can't induce the cancer. So you need something by inflammation to get the bug going. And uh, we were interested in, in knowing what that is, so we did RNA, uh, microbial RNA sequence on these cohorts. See what is the relationship between inflammation and the transcriptomic response. It's a little bit complicated, but uh, let's focus on this. So the circles are the AL-10 alone. So the AL-10 developed inflammation and cancer. The mouse was mono-associated, and we harvested uh, stools from different time, two weeks, 12 weeks, and 20 weeks, and performed the uh, RNA-seq. So what you have is a clustering from a different time. So you have the two weeks transcriptome of these different animals, and then at, 20, at 12 weeks and 20 weeks. So the transcriptome change with the inflammatory response. That will be your conclusion here. And if you go with the RAG now, so you look at the transcriptome of the, of the bugs that was in the AL-10 RAG, who doesn't develop inflammation. And now it's moving very close to the, uh, to the inflammatory. So 
the transcriptomic response of this E. coli was massively driven by uh, adaptation, environment adaptation in the host. Uh, but we found a uh, selected uh, set of genes that are highly regulated by inflammation. So adaptation of the bacteria in the host drive a lot of transcriptomic response. Inflammation will come and, and target select genes that likely, and we're working on these genes, I have no time to, to, to list use these genes, but some of these genes likely will influence the capacity to induce cancer or the fitness of the bacteria. So just to uh, sum up what I've, I've been telling you so far, you have the microbiome that is inducing a host response in a susceptible host that will be uh, inflammatory uh, compartment response, so a lot of inflammation. This inflammation by itself doesn't just affect the host, goes after the uh, luminal uh, microbial compartment and does change the ability or the composition of the microbiome and also likely the activities. And some of these activities could be linked to genotoxin, the PKS I've told you about, and that is the perfect storm when you have an increased uh, likelihood to develop colorectal cancer. So since I'm in the translational section of, 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 the, uh, of the meeting, I thought the gaps and challenges could be that now. How do we move forward from this? Uh, we know there's this biosis and bacterial translocation when you have uh, early onset of cancer or inflammation. So could you modulate this microbiome composition? Pre and probiotics, we heard about that. Bacterial therapy, maybe the Stone Age fecal transplant or a more targeted introduction of bacteria. Antibiotics could be, uh, although it's certainly not a, uh, a long-term therapy. Uh, genetically modified microbiota, that you could introduce enzyme to outcompete activity of another, of another one. Diet and cancer is highly uh, link correlated. Could you change diet to impact the microbiome? And, and decrease your cancer uh, uh, microbiome uh, population. We have pro-effective effector mechanism from these bacteria. I've shown you the PKS. Could you target these genotoxin? And also, could you uh, target bacteria-induced inflammation? Prevent inflammation, prevent the change of microbiome. For real now, for the needs, uh, we need to move the omics down to the target mechanism. You don't want to be the mouse. That was just a movie. It's a happy ending, but a lot of time it is no happy ending. <laughs> you're, you're doomed. So you need to, to, to write a grant that will have uh, a link between the data that generated by a sequencer and, and get mechanism and target uh, uh, related applications. In my case, I need access to clinical isolate. All these bugs that we are, or family, or, or, or group of bacteria that we identify from this, this biosis and sequencing need to be put in the bank. We need to look at them in terms of sequencing. Sequence these bacteria from different cohorts. Could we found pattern or virulence factor that could be uh, you know, unique to a population and, and start asking questions about their function in terms of, of cancer development. We need to get better in the microbiology and, and we have the, go, the high technology that we're using, but the, the old technology, chemostat, turbidostat, multi-stage chemostat, to study behavior of these bacteria. If you have a clinical isolate, which factor uh, could influence the expansion uh, behavior of this bacteria? Any enzymatic activity that could be controlled by diet, introduction, or changing the, uh, the, the, the setup of the uh, bioreactor system. So we need that. And this looks a little bit funky, colonization protocol for germ-free. I mean, people will say, you just introduce the bacteria and you, you're good to go. That's not true. I mean, when we introduce complex community, they are not all of them there. You, you may lose a lot of them because there's no sequential pioneer bacteria coming in and setting the stage for the next wave of bacteria. And, and i give you an example. We had a clinical isolate uh, provided by us uh, from uh, Emma Allen Verco in Guelph University with the Fusobacterium nucleotum that people found associated with colorectal cancer. We took that bug, introduced it to the alt and NACAP, and that, that bug was not able to, to colonize and stay. So it needs another bacteria to come in. So these, when you start 
looking at consortia because cancer is not caused by one, unlikely by one microorganism. It's going to be an association interaction. We need to duplicate that in the animal. Not going to be easy if we don't know how they interact with each other. You can't put them all in a mix and, and hope for the best. And uh, with that, my God, I'm at six seconds of the end. Um, this is my lab. I'd like to recognize all the people involved in this work. Uh, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, the UNC No Biotic Facility, head by Balfour Sarter, instrumental. Uh, UNC Charlotte uh, for Bioinformatics, Cornell and University of Liverpool for the Clinical Isolate. And uh, I thank you for your attention. Okay, we have time for a few questions. Crickets. I think one question so, over here. So, Christian, one thing we were talking about actually at Journal Club with that your cool paper is is the effect of the of the PKS bearing organisms is it just a, is it an incremental genotoxic effect? Because you're getting things like AOM, which is certainly a big genotoxic hit, and a lot of environmental things will do that. So when one focuses on the microbiome here, are you seeing that there's a unique role of the organisms, or is it sort of like recreating the natural setting where the hits are going to be uh, sub, uh, right. sub carcinogenic, and so any additional hit adds to the threshold? Right. I mean, that. That's a great question. We'd like to see the progress. We, it's hard to monitor the PKS activity. If you were to know that it's inducing a sequence of mutation, and then you could, you could start sequencing the host, uh, you know, pre-cancer progression of cancer in your cohort over time and see that, you know, oh, the PKS is getting this hit here and there, and then over time it accumulates to this. Uh, you could try to link it to the activity of the PKS. It does one massive mutation or multiple mutation, and you need the PKS activity for that long to see that. It's a difficult question to answer at this point. We've been doing sequencing on tumors. We were not able to find the usual hit uh, suspect, you know, the EPC, RAS, and all these uh, uh, a susceptible spot that could be mutated. Uh, we didn't find them, so we're not sure what is the PKS endpoint in terms of, of mutation. We know it does DNA damage in vitro, and we saw it in the mouse in vivo, but we're not quite sure how to follow the details of it over time. But I suspect you may have a, an activation a setup of, of PKS activity, and after that, something else is coming. Could be inflammation of the host, preventing repaired mechanism, enhancing epigenetic changes, and then the train left the station and you go into more aggressive cancer. What we say for sure is that the PKS does uh, induce more invasive tumors. So what they do to the epithelium has uh, long-term consequences on the aggressiveness of cancer. Any other questions? And if not, we'll uh, move on. Uh, thank you, Christian. <clears throat> okay, so the uh, final speaker in the session is Julian Davies from the University of British Columbia in Canada, and he's going to talk about harvesting the molecular wealth of the microbiome.